60 seconds in a minute sounds like a fact of nature, but who actually decided it? The answer ties every watch on your wrist to a 4,000-year-old Babylonian trick. Choosing the number 60 for its uncanny ability to slice a day into easy everyday fractions, halves, thirds, quarters and beyond, this ancient math was so useful it shaped not just time, but how we navigate the globe and count the stars. Yet it wasn't a single person or a sudden decision. So why did the world accept 60? And why has no rival decimal time, even atomic clocks, dethroned it? The real story behind who decided a minute has 60 seconds is stranger and more enduring than you think. Picture a world where numbers aren't just for counting sheep or coins, but for slicing up everything, grain, land, even the hours in a day. In ancient Mesopotamia, scribes pressed wedge-shaped marks into clay, not just to keep track of taxes, but to solve a deeper problem. How do you split things up so everyone gets a fair share, no matter the number of people or the size of the pie? For this, they turn to 60. 60 is a number that plays well with others. It divides cleanly by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and even 12. Half of 60 is 30, a third is 20, a quarter is 15, a fifth is 12, a sixth is 10, a twelfth is 5. No messy fractions, just whole numbers. Try that with 10 or 100 and you're stuck with awkward decimals. Tablets like Plimpton 322 and YBC 7289, dug up from the ruins of Babylon and now resting in museum vaults, show the scribe's handiwork. YBC 7289, for example, holds a calculation of the square root of 2 written in base 60, a kind of ancient math homework scratched out nearly 4,000 years ago. Plimpton 322 lists rows of Pythagorean triples, all in sexagesimal notation. These weren't just idle puzzles. The ability to break things into regular parts was essential for trade, for building, for measuring the sky. In their world, being able to say, give me one twelfth of the barley, or let's split this field into fifths, wasn't just convenient, it was survival. Babylonian scribes trained for years to master these calculations. Their multiplication tables and reciprocal tables, all built on base 60, let them handle fractions that stump most people today. The system was so flexible that it could be used for weights, measures, and even dividing time. The logic is simple. If you want to cut up a pizza so every friend gets an equal slice, 60 makes the math easy. That's why thousands of years later, we still count minutes and seconds in 60s. The ancient toolkit built for fairness and practicality is still ticking away at the heart of every clock. Take a moment to imagine the night sky as a giant circle stretched overhead, filled with stars, planets, and the slow-moving moon. Babylonian astronomers, working nearly 4,000 years ago, needed a way to map this endless dome. Their solution was as clever as it was practical. Break the circle into 360 equal parts. Why 360? In their world, the year was thought of as 12 months of 30 days each. 12 times 30 gives you 360. But that's just the starting point. The real magic is in how easily 360 slices up. Cut a pizza into 360 slices and you can hand out halves, thirds, quarters, fifths, sixths or twelfths. No one gets cheated and there's never a sliver left over. This wasn't just a neat trick for parties. Babylonian sky watchers tracked the movement of the sun, the moon, and the planets across this 360-degree grid. Each day, the sun would travel about one degree along its path. Recording the position of a star or planet became as easy as pointing to a spot on the circle. 90 degrees for due east, 180 for south, 270 for west. Their tablets, some still readable today, are filled with lists of star positions, lunar cycles, and predictions of eclipses, all written in numbers that fit perfectly into this system. The 360-degree circle made it possible to turn messy, unpredictable sky events into something you could write down, calculate, and even predict. It was a tool for both astronomy and geometry, a way to measure not just the heavens, but the land below. Think of the circle as a universal measuring tape, one that wraps around both the sky and the earth. The Babylonians could say with confidence that the moon had moved 15 degrees since last night, or that the sun would reach a certain point in 30 more. By marrying arithmetic with the cycles of the sky, they created a system that still shapes how we tell time and measure space. 
The 360-degree circle is more than an ancient artifact. It's the silent structure behind every clock face, every map, and every star chart. Even today, when you glance at a watch or trace a path on a globe, you're using the same slices of the circle that once guided Babylonian astronomers through the night. Egyptian priests stood beneath a night sky crowded with stars, watching for the slow rise of the next deacon. Deacons were special star groups, 36 in all, each one climbing above the horizon in turn as the night passed. These rising stars weren't just a curiosity, they acted as markers, carving the darkness into 12 distinct slices. Each deacon signaled a new hour of the night, a pattern that repeated through the seasons, shifting as the year rolled on. To track the hours, Egyptians used water clocks, clepsidras, where a steady drip marked the passing of time, and the level in the vessel told you which deacon should be rising. Some ceilings in royal tombs, like that of Senenmut, Senenmut, are painted with rows of decans and star clocks, a permanent record of how the heavens ordered the night. But the Egyptians didn't stop at night. They split the day as well, dividing sunlight into 12 parts, each one an hour, pair those with the 12 hours of darkness, and you get a full cycle of 24. The idea of a 24-hour day with 12 for light and 12 for dark is a direct legacy of Egyptian sky watching. These hours weren't equal in length, Summer days stretched the daylight hours, winter nights did the same for darkness, but the structure held. The rhythm of daily life, from temple rituals to field work, followed the steady beat of these hours. Artifacts from this era, like sundials carved with 12 marks or water clocks etched with star names, show how deeply this system shaped Egyptian society. The priests' calculations, tied to the decans, allowed them to predict dawn, schedule ceremonies, and announced the arrival of the new year when the star Sirius rose just before sunrise. While the Babylonians gave us a way to slice things finely, the Egyptians set the pattern for how we count the hours themselves. Their blueprint, 12 hours of day, 12 of night, became the skeleton of the day, a framework that would later meet the precision of base 60 math. The need for equal standardized hours would soon become obvious, especially for astronomers who wanted to measure time as reliably as they measured the sky. Greek astronomers faced a puzzle that numbers alone could not solve. How to bring order and precision to the shifting patterns of the sky. Hipparchus, working in the second century BCE, set out to fix the problem of hours that stretched and shrank with the seasons. He proposed dividing the day into 24 equal parts, equinoctial hours, so that time itself could be measured as steadily as the stars. But even this was not enough for the mathematicians and navigators who needed to pinpoint a star's position or time an eclipse to the minute. Ptolemy, writing his Almagest in the second century CE, took the next step. He broke each degree of the circle into 60 smaller pieces. These were not yet called minutes, as we know them, but pars minuta prima, the first small part. Each of these could be split again into 60 pars minuta secunda, the second small part. What began as a way to describe tiny slices of the sky soon became a toolkit for dividing time itself. In Ptolemy's tables, an angle might be written as 63 degrees, 14 minutes and 30 seconds, though the words were still Latin and the numbers still sexagesimal. The logic was simple. Keep dividing by 60 and you can reach almost any level of precision you need, whether you're tracking the path of a planet or setting the gears of a clock. These minute and second divisions started out as mathematical notations, not units of time. Greek and later Latin scholars used them to solve problems in astronomy, navigation, and geometry. Manuscripts from the Middle Ages show students learning how to multiply and add these tiny parts, always in base 60, always aiming for finer accuracy. The terms stuck by the 12th and 13th centuries Latin translators like Gerard of Cremona carried the language of pars minuta and secunda into Europe's universities. It was here, in the hands of astronomers and teachers, that minutes and seconds began to mean not just fractions of a degree, but slices of the hour itself. The habit of dividing by 60, born in Babylon and refined by Greek scholars, now shaped how the world would measure both the sky and the ticking of the clock. In the centuries after Ptolemy, the torch of astronomical calculation passed eastward. Arabic-speaking scholars, working from Baghdad to Cordoba, became the new stewards of sexagesimal math. 
Al-Batani, writing in the 9th century, compiled tables that let you predict lunar eclipses or the position of the sun, all using base 60 divisions. His Zij al-Sabi, a handbook of the sky, lists planetary positions and prayer times, each calculation broken cleanly into degrees, minutes, and seconds. Thabit ibn Qurra, another giant of this era, translated and expanded on Greek works refining the methods for handling these tiny fractions. In their hands, Base 60 was not just a relic, but a living language for the universe. The astrolabe, a brass disc etched with circles and lines, became the astronomer's computer. Its rotating plates let you read off the time of night or the altitude of a star, all calibrated in sexagesimal units. Some surviving astrolabes from the 10th and 11th centuries still bear the marks. 60 divisions around the rim, each tick a direct echo of Babylonian and Greek practice. These instruments weren't just for scholars. They set prayer times, guided caravans, and kept mariners on course across the open sea. Arabic astronomical tables, or zijes, filled libraries from Samarkand to Toledo. Their pages, dense with base 60 fractions, trained generations of mathematicians. By the time these works reached Europe, the habit of dividing the sky and the hour into sixties was deeply embedded. The continuity is clear. The same numbers, the same divisions, carried through centuries and across continents, waiting for the moment when mechanical clocks would catch up with the math. In the heart of medieval Europe, time began to tick in public squares and cathedral towers. The arrival of mechanical clocks around the 14th century brought a new kind of order, one measured not by the sun or the stars, but by the steady turn of gears and the swing of iron weights. Richard of Wallingford, abbot of St. Albans, designed his astronomical clock in 1336, a machine that could track not just the hours, but also the movements of the sun, moon, and tides. Yet the gears inside were a patchwork of numbers, 48 teeth here, 32 there, not a perfect echo of the sexagesimal math that astronomers used. Even so, the logic of dividing time by 60, inherited from ancient tables and star charts, soon found its way onto the faces of public clocks. It wasn't until the late 16th century that many hands began to appear on towers and dials across Europe. Suddenly, the hour was no longer a single slice, but a wheel of 60 tiny marks, each one a minute. Each minute split again into 60 seconds. The machinery followed the math, 60 divisions around the dial, matching the divisions of the sky and the calculations scribbled in astronomical notebooks. The minute hand, a late addition, made the sexagesimal system visible and practical for everyone, not just scholars. Now the rhythm of daily life, bells ringing, markets opening, prayers beginning, was tied to a system built centuries earlier for tracking planets. The choice of 60 wasn't dictated by the gears themselves, but by the need for a system that everyone could use, one that made fractions easy and time predictable. As clocks spread, the 60 base structure became the heartbeat of cities and villages. What began as an astronomer's convenience became a public rhythm, locking the ancient number 60 into every tick and tock. Try dividing a circle, a day, or a journey at sea by 10. The math gets sticky fast. That's why navigators still trust 60. Each minute of latitude equals one nautical mile, a standard that kept ships on course long before satellites. Now, not everyone was satisfied with tradition. In 1793, French revolutionaries tried to sweep away the old order with decimal time, 10 hours in a day, 100 minutes per hour, 100 seconds per minute. Merchants grumbled, workers missed appointments, and clockmakers cursed their new dials. Decimal time lasted barely two years before Paris returned to the old system. Sixties' stubborn grip comes down to habit and utility, fractional splits that work for sailors, astronomers, and anyone needing a clean cut. Even as technology races ahead, the world keeps ticking to the ancient rhythm of 60. 60 isn't just a relic hiding in old clocks and star charts. It's the backbone of modern life. Every GPS coordinate you punch into your phone uses degrees, minutes, and seconds, mapping the world with the same sexagesimal splits as ancient astronomers. 
Computer networks rely on protocols like NTP to sync clocks, counting seconds since the Unix epoch, January 1st, 1970, each tick a direct descendant of Babylonian math. Film editors scrub through hours, minutes and seconds to cut scenes, while video games and streaming rely on frame rates like 60 frames per second, a nod to the 60 hertz power that once set the pace for televisions. Surveyors measure land in degrees, minutes and seconds, and scientists still use sexagesimal notation to pinpoint stars. Even as atomic clocks define the second with quantum precision, the world's time is still sliced by 60, echoing through every digital timestamp and satellite ping. Atomic clocks define a second with extraordinary precision, 9,192,631,770 vibrations of a cesium-133 atom counted out since 1967. But the Earth itself refuses to keep pace. Our planet's rotation drifts and wobbles, sometimes running a little slow, sometimes a little fast. To keep civil time in sync with the sun, leap seconds were introduced in 1972. Every so often the world's clocks pause for a single silent second, letting the planet catch up. But each leap second throws a wrench into digital systems, telecommunications, GPS, stock exchanges, all depend on time that never skips a beat. Engineers and scientists have argued for decades. Should we cling to the ancient link between time and the turning Earth? or trust the unyielding rhythm of atoms. In 22, the International Telecommunication Union and the World Standards Bodies decided leap seconds will end after 2035. The 60-second minute survives, but the struggle to balance nature and precision continues, ticking forward in atomic time. On a Babylonian clay tablet over 3,800 years old, scribes used base 60 to solve geometric problems, a system chosen for its unmatched divisibility. That practical math shaped how the Babylonians divided circles into 360 degrees, and centuries later, how Greeks like Ptolemy described angles as minutes and seconds of arc. Egyptian astronomers split the day into 24 hours, while Greek and Islamic scholars kept refining these ideas, preserving the sexagesimal tradition. When European clockmakers built the first public clocks in the 14th century, they used 60 tooth gears translating ancient calculation into daily time. No single document names a sole inventor of the 60-second minute. Records show cultural layering, not one decision. Attempts to replace 60, like French decimal time, quickly failed, even as atomic clocks now define the second with cesium-133 and leap seconds reveal the tension between physics and tradition. The base 60 system still shapes global timekeeping. The minute 60 seconds are not the work of one mind, but a Babylonian legacy carried through centuries, locked in by utility, history, and a world built on shared standards.